pretty wild what you can do when you say things that people don't want to hear. And you want you want to you want to be a problem and tell the truth. Everyone's going to hate you. People are going to try and kill you. Maybe they're going to do all these things to you. Like that's what telling the truth costs you. You don't get rich and, and famous, and your life doesn't get easier for telling the truth. Very much the opposite. So it's like, what am I gaining from this? I'm like, I have to. I, I feel I feel a, an obligation, especially to those guys that took a literally a, not a bullet but a bomb for me. Today's Meet Me in the Middle guest is the infamous Jeremy McKenzie. I say infamous because this 14 plus year Canadian Army combat veteran who had no criminal record, had never been charged, and had never been arrested in his life became a person of interest to police across the country just because the people in power don't like what he has to say on his Raging Dissident podcast. I met Jeremy on the phone during the Freedom Convoy in February of 2022. I knew his views were in line with my own because I'd heard the podcast and I'm proud to call him a friend. This interview is a chance for Jeremy to set the record straight. We're talking in detail about Jeremy's deployment to Afghanistan, the unrealistic expectations people have of veterans in this country, and how he became the mastermind behind the fictional Diagonal. Yes, it's Jeremy's imagination our government is terrified of. Welcome to part one of my interview with Jeremy McKenzie. Uh, Jeremy, thanks for agreeing to do the show. I, I know uh, Rachel Gilmore had you booked, but you, <laughs> you backed out of it in, in favor of coming on my show, so I appreciate that. There's just certain, you know... <sighs> dirtier greasier parts of town i just don't go to i just i feel like i'm a budget, so I don't. <laughs> okay i hate to even use her name because people are gonna be like oh who's that i gotta go look for that person no but don't for the viewers who, <laughs> who don't know don't go looking for her she's unemployed like me anyway so a, a tiktoker yeah a tiktoker yes yeah. okay um so you know today i wore this shirt my v for f shirt uh you know jeremy mckenzie is also a veteran now jeremy unlike myself is a that's great you did that like a almost like a uh commercial ad you know how you <laughs> hold the, the cup that was great uh, only three easy awesome. installments of 59.99 you can own one of these smug yeah exactly i'll take my water <laughs> um coffee but but you know there's a difference there's a difference between being a combat veteran and being a regular veteran. I think that by definition, you, you're, you're considered a, a military veteran with 10 years service. And that would be me with 25, but I'm 14. not a combat veteran. Is it 14? Yeah, 14 in change. Okay, could be. All right. Um, I am not a combat veteran, but Jeremy, you're a combat veteran. You served in Afghanistan. Did you deploy elsewhere? Um, I've been around <laughs> some places. Okay. Afghanistan was the, was, the hot, was the hot one. That was the greasy one. Yeah. There. In my 25 years, I missed out on 11 deployments. 11. <laughs> um, a it is a lot. I mean, we're talking going back to, like, I had a chance when I was 19 years old to go to Somalia. Uh, oh, wow. I, I, yeah, I could have gone to Somalia because I joined the militia when I was yeah. 16 years old in 1990. Um, yeah. So that was a, that was a, a, a few rotations yeah. around the sun ago. Yeah. Um, but I want to hear about specifically your time in Afghanistan because... I, I, the reason I want to highlight this is because there is a difference between a, a military veteran and a combat veteran. Um, you know, and that's not to suggest that combat veterans are better soldiers than non-combat veterans. It's, it means that you have, I, I highlight this because it means that you have literally risked your life for your country. You have, you volunteered to join the Canadian military or any volunteer military in the world you deployed and you laid it all on the line and you knew that at the moment you stepped outside the the fob or the forward operating base you could lose your life which is exactly what happened to colonel parker and other people even bobby gerard yeah. uh you know the I, rsm uh, i worked for him you know, i worked for parker i was his uh, signaler for a little while yeah i knew parker as well oh yeah oh really yeah he's my yeah, co he, the battalion yeah yeah, yeah, and um, you know these these two individuals literally drove out of the front gate of the the compound or the the forward operating base yeah. and hit a roadside bomb and were immediately killed. Yeah. Um, you know this is 
this is, you know, people don't understand with the military, there's something called unlimited liability. And it is the only profession in Canada. When you sign the contract to the military, you can lawfully be ordered to your certain death. Yep. You know, police, police don't have that. Firefighters don't have that. Uh, there are mechanisms within those professions where they can say, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not taking that risk. Right. But military in combat, you know, as an officer, even as a, a higher rank than someone else, you've got the legal authority to, to give an order where somebody could be killed. Yeah. Um, and, and that is the, it's referred to as unlimited liability in the military, but you know, you, you volunteered to join the military. You went through all your training. You deployed to Afghanistan and you've been in combat. What is that? I'd, I'd like to hear more detail about your time uh, in Afghanistan and you share whatever you want to share. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I joined, I joined the reserves when I was 17 or yeah, 17 in 2003. Um, that was after we'd, we'd just begun kind of the, uh, the war in Iraq was on TV. So that was my nightly entertainment around that time. And I remember when nine 11 happened, my mom was like, thank God. He's like, your father's too old to go and you're too young. I'm like, well, she was yeah. half right. Uh, yeah. non for another 20 years. So, you know, there was definitely a window, but, um, yeah, there's, I mean, a lot of people join knowing that that is a possibility, but I don't think there's kind of a separation between, um, like nobody thinks it's going to happen to you. You know, you always kind of can rationalize it, you know, one way or another, especially in the reserves, you're not really as obligated. Um, but when we were, uh, when that, when that deployment came up, we, we were volunteered, you know, we were, um, a lot of us were reserve guys and they were backfilling because, and that's how I ended up in the regular force. I just kind of stayed with them after, after the deployment was over, but, and then when it volunteers and when they were asking for volunteers, there was people getting killed every week. So this wasn't like a surprise. We all knew what we were doing, what we were, we were looking for it. We were going looking for trouble essentially, because we're all 19, 20 years old, young guys that want to prove themselves and. Yeah, it's a different feeling when the bus is pulling away from the drill hall in, in Gagetown to the Air, Fredericton Airport, and you wave goodbye to your family, and you just kind of the guy sat next to me on the bus. He didn't he didn't make it back, and you know we, mm -hmm. um, you know we were just like, you know he could tell I was kind of I was kind of like, this is uh, I, I don't know what I was thinking at the time. I just remember kind of looking out the window, but he just kind of tapped me on the shoulder. He's like, you'll be all right, man. It's gonna be all right. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was for me, but not for him. So it was uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, it, it's not until that starts to happen. Once people start getting killed, then it then it sinks in because it's kind of fun and exciting at first. You get there and it's like a it's like a different planet, you know. It's everything's mm -hmm. it looks like a different planet. It looks like being on Mars. You've got these huge big mountains. Everything's brown and gray. I got there in the winter time, so it was January. Right. So a lot of the foliage was not come out. It, it turns into a jungle very very quickly around April, uh, early April, mid April. All of a sudden, everything's green and there's bushes everywhere, and you're wearing a brown uniform. Like, oh, this was the best choice. <laughs> but uh yeah. yeah it's it's like a different world and you you know they've got the call to prayer all the time and there's like there's you know it's the poorest country in the world when i got there so at first you're just kind of like it's just a very exciting very realistic training exercise like you've done and get you know and nothing happens for a while and you get kind of you know into the into the swing of it i guess and then you know one day all of a sudden there's one guy that you've you know lived with for 10 years or five years is just not there anymore because he's blown to bits and then you have to pack up his things and send it home in a box and then you start wondering who's next and there's somebody next and it just becomes this uh very uh it, it's 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 worse i think because a lot of the a lot of the deaths on our end anyway would come from uh ambushes and and things like roadside bombs and stuff it's not something you can mm -hmm. fight or see and then once it's done it's done and and you can hear like the interpreters would have um something called an ICOM. They had like an international, they had like a, they could hear them. They, they were listening, monitoring the Taliban and stuff over the radio and listen, and you can hear them like laughing and high fiving and, you know, we got them, this kind of stuff. And we're just like, and then you go back out to these towns and these villages looking for people and you just, you know, you've got little kids even just looking at you going, you know, like this and you're like, yeah, Ooh, which one of these is going to, you know, lob a grenade at my head and in this, and you're just like, there's death every, it could come from anywhere, any time of day. And it just becomes mm -hmm. this, you're, there's no safe area. Like uh, there was one yeah. guy, a, a Captain Trevor Green, I think his name was. He was yep. just yep. down for a meeting, got an axe the in the head. So just came and yeah, yeah, sunk an axe into his head. Like this kind of stuff is just middle of the night, middle of the day, in your camp, out of the camp. Doesn't matter. It's, it's just it's uh, anywhere all the time. So it's like it's a stressful mm -hmm. environment. Yeah, you got to be on your toes all the time. Yeah, and I, 
You know, I, I talked to James Top uh, about his time. Like this is years ago. James and I were talking about his time in Croatia because mm-hmm. James was in the Medec pocket in um, ninety three, ninety or sorry, ninety two, ninety three. Yep. Um, and he was, you know, he was there for a year, and he said the first three months boring, the next yep. six months terrifying, the last yep. three months boring. Yep. Um, but you know, like in my experience, I worked with uh, three thirteen Canadian soldiers. Uh, that had been killed in Afghanistan. Uh, and I remember each and every time that their remains were, were flown into Trenton. And when the wheels touched down in Trenton, you know, you're standing at attention at your your desk for a moment of silence. And this happens across the country. Yeah. Um, but I, I know I've seen the video of what it's like for the guys in Afghanistan loading the aircraft with the remains of their soldiers that were killed in theater. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, being in Canada, you see the, the caskets coming off of the aircraft in Trenton. Um, you know, a friend of mine I knew for 19 years, Dennis Brown, uh, was killed over there. He was a Lincoln and Welland, uh, warrant officer. He was a reservist, uh, went over wife for kids, uh, went to Afghanistan and was killed by a roadside bomb. And, you know, this is this is something that was hard because during the war, uh, just prior to the war, we had the decade of darkness <laughs> where the Canadian military was not appreciated. The public didn't care about the military. It wasn't of, in, of any interest to them. Uh, I, I helped out in the ice storm that we had here in the mid-90s. And people looked at us with, with disgust when we came to the door to see if they wanted, you know, Coleman mm. stoves and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and the public only viewed us as really peacekeepers or a labor force in a domestic response. And then Afghanistan happened and Canadian soldiers started getting killed. And then all of a sudden it was, thank you for your service. You know, yeah. there was this new emergence in the psyche of the Canadian public that, Hey, wait a minute, these guys are war fighters. Right. And then we fast forward now to a couple of years, you know, the current time that we're in, We get Mm. to even the convoy and we're seeing veterans like Chris Deering being beaten by cops. So there's this sort of swing in the public psyche about how do we view veterans? They're very, uh, the public is very, what have you done for me lately? Kind of a a very short term memory. um, You know? Yeah. So you were there. I mean, you've been in combat. You've been in a firefight, I presume, uh, your time in Afghanistan. Uh, I think I saw an interview with you on Viva and you had talked about an RPG exploding right near your head. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah I'm uh, you know, legally deaf in my left ear from that. It um, yeah. impacted a, it was an olive tree actually. I was kind of using as a cover slash screen. I was kind of trying to peek around and use to get a view on things. And there's, you know, me and another guy were there and he saw the guy um, take a shot at us before I did. I saw his face and he, you know, he was like, Oh no, he yelled incoming or something like a movie. And I just, I turned enough to see the guy, you know, two yeah. pointed right at us. And I just leaned and I, I winced like I'm done. Like it's coming yeah. right at us. And it just slammed into this tree right in front of me. And neither of us were hurt, but I just, you know, the ringing was yeah. just this yeah. forever. And they're like, Oh, that'll go away. It never went away. It was 20 years ago. It's still, wow. <laughs> or however many yeah. years ago now it's still there. It's still the same. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it was, there was some pretty hairy, uh, there were some pretty close calls for sure. Yeah. Do you, how do you feel when people say, Hey, thank you for your service? How does that phrase sound? I think to you? Pe- I don't, I don't like it. Not because it's, I just, I think people feel obligated to, they don't really know what to say. They feel like it's kind of a social, like, this is just what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It, a lot of everybody finds it awkward. Like it just it's awkward for them. It's awkward for us. Everyone's just kind of like, I don't really know what to th- say say yeah. about this. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I it's hard to. Um, I really don't like. And I was talking about this recently with a couple of guys, and they really were uh, like civilians. They did, they don't know any better. And I said that because um, I was talking about this you know, anonymity and stuff on the internet, and it, it progressed into this. That um, you'll see, like uh, at the Maple Leafs games and stuff, they'll give, a, they'll have like an appreciation night, or they'll have some kind of parade, or, and it's always like that's a logistics officer. There's a, you know, that's a cook, that's a, you know, a technician, mm-hmm. and that's all these things. And where's the 19 year old guys that had their legs blown off in Panjway Valley? 
It's never, and it's nothing against anybody, but if, if that were me, I would say, I don't, I can't accept this because I, you know, I did this. Mm -hmm. I slept in an air conditioned trailer. I ate fresh food every day. I slept on a mattress. I used the internet and the welfare phones to talk to my wife and kids every day if I wanted to. And for me to sit here and accept this, you know, because while all these people are there, cla and when, when they look at this, they don't know the difference. What they're imagining and what every every person imagines when they think of, like, war veterans and stuff, they're thinking of, like, a, you know, Vimy Ridge and the Battle of the Somme and, you know, Saving Private Ryan and shit. Like, those are the infantry guys. Those are the combat guys, and they don't yeah. – and they're just happy to, like, soak it up and be like, yeah, that's basically me. Or the, I find that offensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially when it, it's just because I'm like – I knew a lot of people that got killed. Like, we had uh, – like, almost a quarter, of my, a quarter of my platoon was killed. We had a whole section wiped out. And they, we switch spots with me. I, I switch spots with these guys. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like they're they're. De I'm here because they're not literally. If it had been the other way around, that would be me. I would have been, I would have been killed um, because we, for like leave block reasons, we had a good one and they had a bad one and they wanted to switch. They were all married. We weren't, and they had kids and we didn't. So we were like, they wanted the one in the middle of the tour, and we were like, yeah, mm -hmm. sure, fine, we'll take this other one. And then you know, we they took our we switched spots and they took the, the lead uh, order of battle and then whack, they got, you know, smashed by a triple stack Danny tank mine that, um, mm -hmm. blew the lav in half essentially and killed everybody. And there was six of them killed in that one go. And they took, I think it was eight body bags to get them back because they didn't know which piece of who belonged to what and there were eight mm -hmm. different stretchers to, to bring them out. So like mm -hmm. that's, uh, <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, I, yeah, I was Afghanistan. It was, you know, the radios were going and it was scary. Like there's people making PTSD claims because they, of what they heard on the radio. It's like, oh, you heard us being killed on the radio and that was stressful for you, is it? So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's definitely a divide there um, that most guys don't talk about because it's kind of was beaten down into us from the, the higher ups and the, the, the officers that like it's one army, one team, one, you remember that? They mm -hmm. had this whole... Yeah. You know, and it's like, we're all the same and we're all the same. And it's like, well, I understand the sentiment, but that's just factually incorrect. I mean, you're not, mm -hmm. you've got guy, you've got 18 year old kids out here getting blown shot to hell and blown to bits. And, um, you know, these are, you know, there's people back there that, you know, you'd never know. They're basically just on a, on a it's, it's safer in Kandahar airfield than it is in, than it is in Toronto. Like you're more <laughs> likely to get killed on the streets of Toronto than you are in that airfield, man. And, yeah. uh, it, it's yeah. there's a bitterness there and, they, and everybody gets paid the same and everything and like it, it's really no different and and uh they're the guys that get that get uh, forgotten the most is the ones that gave the most and it's mm -hmm. you know it's a it's it, it it creates a bitterness and that's kind of a part of a lot of where um i came from is it, i mean <laughs> where who i am now where that was come from was was because of um you know, I don't want to get into the politics of the war or the conspiracy or any of that stuff right now. But I like this is uh, what are we doing here? What is any of this mm -hmm. for? And what do any of these guys get killed for? And you know, and there's you know, there's no good answers to that. So you know, I I became very vocal and and um, outspoken about you know challenging government power and authority and mm -hmm. people just blindly believing and doing what they're told because I did that once upon a time and I nearly lost my life for it. I get permanent injuries. I've got my back and my knees are all jacked up. I'm deaf in one ear. And, you know, I've got all of these. You know, um, so it's important that you, you know, people are t tell the truth and know what they're doing and, you know, um, don't just blindly walk into something because the TV said it was a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, my own, what was hard for me was when, when I was in the military was the fact that you'd have fathers, mothers going to Afghanistan or deploying overseas yep. two, three, four times. Yeah. And in, in my case, I had a, a, a very serious family issue that I, I, I almost went to task force 308. Uh, mm. but you know, my, son, <laughs> my, yeah, my son, my son was due to have open heart surgery Oof. and, and despite, uh, you know, my efforts to go, the army overruled me. Uh, there's, mm. there's a lot of complicated issues to the story, but for me, it was difficult to be, as trained as I was, being an officer in the Canadian military, seeing other fathers going, doing, you know, one, two, three, four tours, yeah. and I haven't done any, and, and you, that starts to wear on you that you're not yeah. lifting your, yeah. your part of the load, right? Yeah, and there's, it's hard. There's uh, it's guys that did one or two tours, and they're like, I only did one, I only did two, like it wasn't enough, because there's guys that did five, six, seven. And yeah. there's, they, they could go and you could do five tours and have nothing happen to you. 
you know, mm-hmm. barely even. It's like, I think somebody got shot once, like, but nothing really happened. Other guys are there for three weeks, half their platoon gets killed, and they go home full of shrapnel from a, an A-10 mm-hmm. that strikes their entire company. So it's like, you don't know. Yeah. The, the, the measure is like, because none of us know, but we all know what's possible, and you've mm-hmm. accepted that. Once you get on the bus, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's, where, that's where it gets serious. And you're willing, if you're yeah. willing to go out there and put your feet on the ground, not knowing what's going to – I mean, you could be that person. You could mm-hmm. – nothing could happen, or you could, you know, have – your life could be over. Mm-hmm. And it's, that's just part yeah, of the game. I, I think when you fast forward into when the Americans pulled out of Afghanistan the way they did, and then you start to look at the sacrifices that 158 Canadians made over there and, and countless yeah. unknown uh, people that are badly yeah. wounded. Yeah. Uh, Five times as at, many, I think, was the, was yeah, the number. Right? Yeah, and, and when you look at the net effect and you realize, you know, what was it for? Yeah. Like, what did we accomplish ultimately? All that sacrifice, yeah. everything that those people gave, and for what? And I And I often think of Dennis Brown and I think, you know, you're a father of four, you had a wife, you had a job, you volunteered, you went, you were killed. Yeah. And for what? What did it accomplish overall? And and so sometimes I, I, I'm embarrassed about the fact that I didn't deploy and I do have, mm. um, you know, I'm, I'm right with how that all happened. But then I have these moments where I think maybe I'm lucky I didn't go. You know, yeah. I still, I'm still here. I'm still relatively sane. I have my fingers and toes. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, maybe it's a good thing I didn't end up going, but you know, I, th- I, I, I wanted to ask you about your military career and that level of sacrifice that you've given, because now we come years later into the future. And, you know, and I asked specifically about that, thank you for your service, because mm-hmm. what does that really ultimately mean? Like, thank you for your service because it was, con- it's convenient for me, but any other thing that you do. Which is yeah. inconvenient for me. Yeah. Like go to a convoy, have a podcast, create yep. diagonal, you know, these things. That's not convenient for me. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, there's a, they, they want, pe- they, like anything else, because most people are governed by their televisions and popular culture, and, and that's basically going to direct their worldview. So they have this idea of what they think you should be or what you're supposed Mm -hmm. to be as a veteran. And then when you don't fit in that box, it's offensive Mm -hmm. to them. And they think you're the one that's wrong because you're not like, this is not what you're supposed to be like. And I'm like, I assure assure you, I'm a very average, typical infantry guy. I'm just very honest and, you know, open. A lot of the, most of my audience initially on were are their army guys. And uh, after I did the, uh, I was protesting, you know, the, the, you know, Omar Cotter hero worship, which was happening in Halifax, the whole city comes out, it's a sold out event, the whole big thing. And, and, um, you know, I took the, the ferry over to, over to Halifax ferry was named after my roommate, the guy was actually killed on the bus, Chris Stanix. I'm like, this is what he gets. He gets a, 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 that's it. You know, Oh, we did our part, but we're going to, we're going to do this. And, um, you know, I had thousands of messages over the next couple of days from people still in the military or people that are retired that were like, fucking finally somebody said something because it's just, you know, it's just not proper. We're not, we're supposed to be the quiet professionals. We don't complain. We don't, you know, and I understand that, but I mean, at what point though, does somebody say this is, you know, something's got to be done or something, something, some things need to be said. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and yeah, you get, uh, it goes one way or the other. Some people are either, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people. It's either love them or hate them kind of a thing, right? I don't know. Mm-hmm. There's not a whole lot in between. And people yeah. don't like it when you don't. Yeah, they, they, they expect the, the Canadian veteran to just stand there with their medals on and their berets and, you know, be there for Remembrance Day and then quietly mm-hmm. go away and not really, you know, uh, or they want you to be like an 80-year-old man that's just, you know, that's it. And that's all they want from you. And they don't want anything else. And and it's like, it's, it's uh Proves to me, like, so you really don't care. A lot of people are like, oh, well, we're so appreciative of your service. Like, well, not really, because I don't even get the, I, I don't even get the respect to have an opinion. You don't even, I don't even get to say from my own lived experience mm-hmm. what, I, what I believe uh, without being chastised and called a terrorist. So how much is my service really worth to the average Canadian person? And in, in, in mine and my compatriots and other others' opinions, it's, it's very little to nothing. Mm-hmm. So we don't. There's a reason guys go live in the woods. Like, where, where, why is there nobody at the legions anymore? Because it doesn't represent us. There's no, there's no guys my age in the 30s and their 40s in the legion. 
Mm-hmm. They're not anywhere. They're off. They're, they've checked out of society. They're not anywhere. You don't see them because mm-hmm. this, this place isn't for us anymore. We've been thrown away and ignored. And if anybody tries to say, like, you know, they want to come out and, and express themselves and, and they get shouted down. And I mean, look what they did to James Top, speaking of. You know, yeah. he had as much support as he had, which was, you know, great. There was just as much opposition from his own people, mm-hmm. people coming out saying he should be stripped of his job and thrown in prison and he's a terrorist mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff. When he didn't, what did he do? He's, you know, it's well, because they, he does, he's, he's not yeah. conforming to what they, mm-hmm. you know, so he must yeah. be bad. And it's just like, yeah. wow. So you can put your, like, I'll die for this place. And I'll put, like, you'll go forward. Like, there's where death is. And it's waiting for mm-hmm. you. And then you get on the bus and drive towards it, fully knowing what you're doing. That mm-hmm. means nothing to these people. And it's like, you don't, no. and I'm supposed to sit here. I'm supposed to shut up and I'm supposed to let this career politician who's done nothing but, you know, Mm -hmm. parasite off the system and make millions of dollars is for 20 years. He's going to tell me that I'm an odious dirtbag. Okay. Well, you know, the day James Top marched into Ottawa, uh, there was a counter protest there. And ironically, it was led (laughs) by uh, a military cook. (laughs) <laughs> right. Well, I, I'm not yeah. going to say anything more about this person. Oh, that um, was created equal. There was a meme yeah. that's a classic <laughs> that we also got in trouble for at work. Uh, the guys would share it around, and it came down in an O group for people. I, I was explaining this on my pod. An O group is like a, it's like a it's like a meeting, you know, business meeting. Yeah. All right, everybody in the conference room, and we're gonna. So they come down, and it's like, all right, nobody share this anymore. This is very offensive and upsetting. And it was Afghanistan, and it said experiences may vary. And you had a couple of guys on a, on a patrol on the, on the top, and they're just covered in dust and dirt and just look like you'd expect in the movies, right? It's like, that's the infantry. Yeah. Everybody's dirty, hasn't showered in weeks, and they're just uh, blood on their feet, you know? And underneath you have two women fully in makeup, like, ha, freshly showered, and they're waiting in line for Tim Hortons. And that was true. That meme was 100% true. It's like you could be this or you could be that. Like there's a whole wide variety of things that go on over there. And they were like, well, this isn't, this isn't inclusive basically. Like how this makes those – and this infuriated me. This was kind of the beginning of like what is going on around here. The, the, these poor – they were both officers. They are both captains and majors or something. Mm-hmm. They're offended by this because they're being singled out. And, and it's, so I'm like, wait a minute. So the people who no one killed or attacked or really – you know. There to be, we need to worry about their feelings. But these guys who are going home in boxes, they're not even worthy of any kind of recognition at all. And this was after they, these bottom people voted to like, no, we we shouldn't have a combat badge because General Hillier, if anybody remembers, wanted to have yes. an insignia you put on your uniform every day. That would just, if you're walking around on the base and there's somebody in the lineup next to you or sitting on the bus, you can look and say, oh, well, this guy was, this guy was in the in the you know <laughs> out there yeah, with he was a, in it. the yeah. Yeah. And they're like, nah, because then how do I look like a badass? How do I, how do I yeah. project that I'm the same as them when I, the only way to get that evidence is to go do that. And they were like, no, well, let's just shut that down. So that's the, that's the Canadian brass mentality. It's 98%, uh, you know, uh, bureaucrats and in, in logistics mm-hmm. and support trades and stuff. And I think it was Andrew Leslie, one of the generals that who they banished as well because he was talking too much sense and, you know, mm-hmm. before he joined the Liberal Party. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Whatever>. but, <laughs> but he said, uh, I think it was him, he said, they got, we need more teeth and less tail. You know, there's, we're yeah. focusing entirely on the wrong end of this. And, and of course, he had to be shut up. So mm-hmm. it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you get out of the military and you start training this uh, very dangerous militia group called <laughs> Diagalon. And, yeah. you know, for, for the viewers, uh, we're going to get in exactly what Diagalon is, but um, I'm, I'm just afraid that this segment's going to be cut up and it's going to be on, okay. uh, you know, CBC tomorrow that we're, we're you know, it's a I joke. I don't know. Okay? They're, they're scared of me. They don't want to, they haven't said anything about yeah. me since I got out of prison. So, yeah. So, so, you know, I was asked uh, a few days before you, when we both testified at the uh, Public Order Emergency Commission, I, I was asked about Diagalon. Um, the, my, the only thing I regret about that answer to the Diagon was that I couldn't remember the vice president's name was Philip. That was the only part of it that I, I couldn't get right. He's, um, he's never going to forgive you for that either. He's very <laughs> upset about this. Oh, I know. But, but, you know, like I remember during the convoy, uh, cause I had heard of Diagon from a, a really good friend of mine's son, like six months before I heard about Diagon and, um, but during the convoy, you had shared a video uh, where you and a couple of the guys were on there laughing hysterically, and you were showing clips of Liberal Party 
uh, that was during talking. that was yeah that it was, was in during the, middle the convoy of, well, it was in the middle of the debates and they're talking about the domestic terrorist group diagonal and you yeah. guys are all laughing on the thing and i see this video and I called you and I said, Jeremy, tell me everything there is to know about Diagon <laughs> right now, because yeah. I know we're going to get hit with this hard, right? Yeah. So we had a great conversation, but but I, I'd like for you to kind of share with the viewers Diagon. Like, how did Diagon start? Because I think it's a fascinating story about how it started uh, to where it is today. Yeah, well, I'm I'm trying to I'm going to start writing a book here soon. It's probably going to take me a year, but hopefully I can get it out there because it's just Mine it is taking me over a year. Oh, yeah. it's if you're going to do it right, it's it's a commitment yeah. for sure. Oh, yeah, it's a it's pretty ridiculous. So the name itself should have been a clue. I thought it was like that's a really stupid, obviously r silly, ridiculous name. That's like something you'd see out of The Simpsons, right? So I'm like, that's mm -hmm. funny. Um, what happened was, and it really what it what it is now is is uh, it's it's a it's like the fan club. It's the support network of my podcast, and and now it's kind of become its own kind of community of um, mm -hmm. you know just like minded people. It's like that's their that's their banner. That's their try. It's like we're the the Montreal Canadiens fans because they you know mm -hmm. that's what their that's what their flag is for, and that's what it means. It's just it's, that's who they are. Is that's what they're into. But how it started was um, during the pandemic. I, uh, it was clear there's a cultural divide, um, between certain areas and, you know, Midwest United States, Texas, Florida, Alberta and Saskatchewan at the time weren't following any of the mandates. They're like, this is, you know, we're not doing this lockdown nonsense crap in Alaska and so on. So I was like, there's like a swath of like, right, like a diagonal line from Alaska to Florida in the center, the center kind of parts of the, of the continent are all, you know, basically conservative leaning, um, you know, suspicious and questioning the, this, this whole thing. And then the other sides were the opposite. So mm -hmm. I said, um, yeah, we'll just everybody just move to these areas and we'll just create a super state and separate. Like it, it was, you know, again, obviously this isn't impossible. This isn't going to happen, but mm -hmm. we're just having fun with it. And then we thought, yeah, we should have a name. What should we call it? And that's what came up with the name for it. I made the made the flag for it on the toilet. I was like, eh, it's a <laughs> it's black square. I took my finger and went, yeah, like a couple times. I'm like there, there's your because it's Alaska to Florida. That was the flag. And then. And then there's all kinds of national games and like it just became this fantasy, you know, mm -hmm. to, to make fun of and kind of cope with, you know, the craziness that we were all enduring. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of evolved into just uh, that's synonymous now with like me and the other guys and, you know, um, the, the community and the which is, uh, you know, an online uh, content creation community mostly. Mm -hmm. And then there's some there's some political activism. We do. I've done some public speaking and rallies and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But. Um, yeah, that's, that's really all there is to it. There's certainly no militia at any point. Like, no. I'm very capable of doing that. This was my job for nearly 15 years. I used to train teenagers how to, you know, go use machine guns and automatic grenade launchers at night, night vision in the rain in the woods with, you know, 50 other guys and make sure nobody gets killed. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're like, oh, you guys are like, okay. I didn't teach anybody how to tie their boots properly, let alone anything else. So if I mean, yeah. if this is a militia I've created. I've done an absolutely horrible job. Terrible. <laughs> job. Yeah, terrible job. Yeah. But there, for, you know, the origins of this, there was a, there was a barbecue. I, I seem to remember you were looking at planning a big barbecue um, to try to get like-minded people to come together. And I think that was oh. out in, it could have been Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah. This is this is when the law enforcement really got a, really got uh, cranky about because they're. I mean, they don't mind if you're online. Kind of. I mean, they kind of do. You get monitored by the you know the state. The, the, the well, them and and their contract goon goblin people that live on the internet and have nothing to do but follow you around and hate everything you're doing. And, you know, yeah. we're gonna tweet about it. I'm like, I got my little violin here that I play for them i'm just like oh are you guys gonna have a little tweet you're gonna tweet well i'm just gonna hear this is just for you let, let me let let me hear all about your uh, i don't care yeah but um i like, there was just uh because a lot of these people had known each other online and mm -hmm. i'd been at this for a few years at this point and i was in saskatchewan and there's a lot of my audiences may is western canadian based a lot of them are ontario but a lot of them are western mm -hmm. canada so we're like let's have some people and 50 or 60 people came from all over the country most of them, 99% of them were complete strangers, you know, in real life wow. until they met each other and everybody was drinking. So I'm like, this could get really bad, but everyone had a great time. And I remember just kind of standing back uh, from the crowd. They're all sitting around a fire. There's a couple of guys playing guitars and, and there was kids there and their wives had brought and everybody was, I was like, look how, and everyone was so happy. Mm -hmm. They were in such a good time because they felt at home amongst their, their own people, their tribe, their culture, right? Mm -hmm. Like their in-group of, your know, cultural in-group 
and it's a it's a need it's a human need to be you know in in your where your people are you need to have that or to, for your sanity for your for and your it, happiness and it is it is during the pandemic so there were yeah. this is post lockdowns oh yeah this was not yeah. allowed at the time right yeah. so okay. i started so i said uh, it was another friend another our army officer guy actually was quoting um I don't think Nietzsche or, or Jung or somebody, but he said, uh, I think the quote was just find the others. Mm -hmm. And that really struck me. I was like, that is a very profound thing to say. That's, that's a big key to life, isn't it? So yeah. I started saying, uh, find your friends is what I called it. The find your, and they said, oh, he's going around recruiting a militia, which was, no, I'm trying to yeah. like this, this pocket of people. Like I was like, this needs to happen everywhere. And people should be doing this everywhere and coming together and meeting each other and getting out of these shells and, and remi remembering that we do exist as a, as a people and a nation and a community and we can have each other's back and support each other. We don't have to sit there and, re and wait for the government to save you, to deal with it. I mean, because that's, that's like a slave mentality. I mean, this isn't who we are as people, as a Canadian you know, people to sit around, oh, I hope the government saves the day and I'm just going to sit here quietly and, and obey everything. Like, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that and then, and then all of a sudden, you know, the police are poking around and CSIS and all these, they've, I've had hundreds of people tell me now they've had them come to their work and their wife's work and, you know, their children's school, like just, you know, looking for, for whatever, because of the astroturfing narrative that these, um, you know, government stooges had put out there and these media clowns like, ah, it's a militia and it's all this kind of stuff. So I, uh, had leaned into it at one point, but the plan, the goal of, um, trolling uh the anti-hate network specifically but also mm -hmm. like the media i figured they might pick up on this but once people sink their teeth into this and really look at this it's going to be it's going to blow up in their face because it's it's yeah. it's laughable right that was the idea so we took a picture and i was like at, at one of these barbecues there's like 50 60 people and i had uh some of these like skull masks they're also afraid of i bought them on amazon and for this exact mm -hmm. purpose and had some guys and they had some of them had their shotguns and stuff they're all legally owned you know there's nothing yeah. illegal about it. The and we just took this picture and i put like redacted over everybody's faces and stuff and 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 of course they took it predictably and said, "Look, oh my God, it's the terrorist!" You know, and I was like, "Oh, this is mm -hmm. going to be so funny when it blows up in their face later." But to my uh, surprise, there's no adults really in the room anymore, and the media just ran, mm -hmm. didn't ask questions. Just went with it. I didn't ask. Nobody asked me a single question. They just took it at face value and ran with it. I didn't get interviewed yeah. once. I've still yet to this day be asked a single question by the RCMP or CSIS or anyone regarding any of this. Mm -hmm. Not not a single. And I'm not hiding. You know, I've been very yeah. open about that. I'll talk to anybody anytime, and nobody. No, nope, they don't. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just looking for a bet. They're looking for. Um, they need an excuse, and they need a. They need somebody to. They need a punching bag to justify what they've been doing. And I mean, what do you take Diagalon out of the picture? How do you justify the Emergencies Act? What's your, you know, what do you got? You got nothing. You got. Yeah. That was yeah. the best you've thing. Gotta, that was the best they could do. Yeah, you've you've got a guy with a Nazi flag, <laughs> and another another guy with a um, uh, the what's the other flag? The uh, Confederate flag. Yeah. Uh, to me, it was a Dukes of Hazard flag. But <laughs> you know, like you've got the Confederate flag, you've got the Nazi flag, and you know, we heard the testimony of the, of CSIS. Uh, I was sitting in yeah. the audience listening to to the Three Stooges up there. I didn't get to hear it. About, I was in prison. Yeah, you were, <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> so they bring these these three in, and they go through this whole script on how they assess uh, ideological yeah. violent extremism or IMVE. Yeah. Show me and the violence. They, they, yeah, yeah. They, they go through this whole outline on how they do it and that it's their job to investigate. And then Brendan Miller says, okay, well, you've got these, these, uh, this guy with the Nazi flag. You've got the guy with the Confederate flag. You've got all these photos. You've got the guy's license plate. You just outlined for us that your job is to make assessment about this. And he said, who's the guy in that photo? Who is the guy with the Confederate flag? They're like, I don't know. You don't know. It's like you just sat there on the stand and, and explained to us that it was your job to investigate this exact kind of thing. And you don't know who that is. You know why you uh, don't know who it is? Because it was probably you guys. It was probably yeah. CSIS who well, had the Nazi flag or the Confederate flag looking it, for as a honey trap is really it, the way well, it I proves it. that they're they're interested in policing thought and politics, not crime. Yes. Yes. Which is means you're, you're the Stasi then. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, you guys are embarrassing. And I said this during yes. the inquiry. I said, this is the biggest national intelligence failure in, in history, in the history of the country, probably the world. Of any Western yeah. country, this is the yeah. most embarrassing thing anyone's ever done. I um, said the and, same and thing. to throw yeah. a bone to like, I, I'm obviously no fan of the liberal government, but I don't think any mm -hmm. of these pol political parties, I think they're all scum and liars and professional manipulators. But, mm -hmm. you know, they're like, oh, CISA says China this and China that. And I'm like, I don't believe anything that comes out of those people. Like they, they're incompetent. 
They're either mm-hmm. or both grotesquely incompetent or they're politically compromised to the point that they're just political police. They're just thought police, and they're just being directed mm-hmm. to whoever they're told to go after and silence and persecute and put in prison or, or whatever. Because what happened to ISIS, and where are all these, these Chinese influence and these police stations? And, and, you know, there's other things going on, and you have 50% of your domestic resources directed towards me? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know how you justify that. To your, and yeah. and uh, it's embarrassing. It's they, it yeah. should be disbanded. That entire organization should just be disbanded, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I, I said the same thing when I testified. I said, you know, there should be a public inquiry about yeah. CSIS and the intelligence yeah. community to focus on Diagon. That is yeah. that is something that yep. is probably one of the most embarrassing things, at least in yep. a decade coming from our intelligence community. They they so, said, you know, you had the public safety minister up there saying, hey, it's a it's a violent uh, group of people with a steel resolve and they're organized and they're everywhere and it's like, okay, and that's why we need the emergency. Okay, where's the arrests? Mm-hmm. Where's the web, where, yeah. where? Where is it? Nothing. So, There's nothing has happened. So I guess they're still out there planning these yeah. attacks, aren't they? Mm-hmm. There, there is a photo. There is the photo. Uh, there's a couple of photos I want to talk about. Uh, there is a photo with you in a certain person who later went on and was, I believe, charged for murder. Okay. But unfortunately, you were in oh, the photo with him. Not murder, but oh, or was it a murder? I thought you, I, I could be wrong. I mean, I, I don't believe anything that the media says. Yeah, okay. And well, I'll wait and see where you're going with this. Yeah, I, th- I thought yeah, I knew but, what you were talking about. Yeah, but there was, you know, an individual, the media was running with this headline. There was a photo with you uh, posing with somebody who was allegedly charged for for murder uh big guy big muscular guy that are you I talking think about story, yeah yeah he starts with conspiracy to commit murder okay there you go yes. so okay. i got that detail wrong but i mean like this is the reason i highlight this is the absurdity of the photographs mm-hmm. okay there's also a second photograph uh a bunch of weapons from coots mm-hmm. and there just happened to be a little badge on one of the vests yeah. with the diagonal symbol um you know, this is the kind of evidence that is so mm. shoddy. This is like a first semester law student could rip this stuff yeah. apart. Very desperate, These are not, yeah. they're very desperate, right? This is what the media media ran with. Um, but, you know, one of the barbecues that you were involved with, uh, and I want to kind of touch on this one because it's important to what I want to talk about next with yep. involving Canada-wide warrants. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah. so you're at a barbecue, uh, yeah. you're in a relationship with a young woman who later befriends a individual, I think from Quebec. Um, if I got my, my story right, but you're at a barbecue, there's a bunch of people, you're seeing a, a woman and an incident breaks out. So I'm going to let you take it away from there. Cause you know, the, the details a lot better, obviously than I do. Well, I mean, it's still in, in process. I can't really get into too much of it, but the trial's going to be, I think, in January around that time. We're looking forward to it. I have no, I mean, I've pled not guilty to everything because, and mm-hmm. I don't have a whole lot of concern about it because at the end of the day, they have to prove that you did whatever they're charging you with. And I know what I did and didn't do. So I think they're going to have a hard time proving something that didn't happen. Um, so I'm not, are, so I'm not, the charges? Yeah. Oh, which so what ones? Was the, got, uh, the, the, um, the one. The one with the young woman, the the one. Uh, uh, yeah, so that one. Yeah, I've got a a, a two six six assault charge, which is um, the same as like a, if I poked you in the chest or spit on your foot. Like it's yeah, like the most minor, and that's what netted me a, in a national, you know, cross Canada warrant to come get me for for that, mm-hmm. which was um, six months after you know this the alleged this incident happened. Then and six months later, decide to anyway. I don't want to get into it uh, too much, but it's you know in the mm-hmm. process. But uh, something you mentioned earlier was um, yeah, so Lysa, yeah, they uh, yeah that that whole the whole coots thing. They they tried to you know tie that to me and and uh, you know my lawyers did a you know great job during the, the POEC to find all these because I couldn't do much behind bars, and I think yeah. that was you know the the idea. They went through my social media history. Like, here's a video of you saying this and saying that and saying this. And it's uh, I'm saying things like, don't even speed. Don't even throw a snowball. Don't even litter. Don't do anything. Don't give them anything because they, you give them an inch, they're going to rip that wide open and use that as a reason to take down this entire protest. And it's going to be mm-hmm. – so you can't, you can't do anything even remotely elite. Like, go to, like, a comical degree of caution, you know. Mm-hmm. So I saw that uh, video. So does that mean – oh, th- that's what I said. So that means – 
load up trucks full of guns and, and go to a pro- – obviously not, right? So, I mean, that has yeah. nothing to do with me. Um, and that's – I mean, we'll find out. I don't know mm-hmm. – I don't know about as much as the average person as, as far as that goes on. I mean, I wasn't involved, so I really don't – I can't say one way or another what, what went on there. But I do know that the, the government and the, uh, the head of very vested political interest in finding something, and they really didn't like me anyway and what was going on, so – you know, I said, uh, like, was there a Whalen Jennings CD in any of these guys' trucks? Maybe he's in he's in connection. Like, does one guy I saw had a Metallica shirt on? Is Lars Ulrich in the area? We better put out a warrant for him too. I mean, I've sold we sold tens of thousands of these patches and flags and things, man. Like, they're all over mm-hmm. the world. They're all over the place. They're in Australia. They're in America. They're in Japan. You know, am I responsible for all? Of it? Come on. I mean, that that should be obvious to anyone doing minutes of investigation and and yet you know this is CSIS. this is the top of the this is the canadian nsa mm-hmm. wow you know very very impressive right, right. work guys yeah so i want to talk about you know that particular incident six months later uh yeah. you you were arrested on a canada-wide warrant yeah is yeah there, that i was trying there... to deal with and they, yeah. tra- they they played it up like I was hiding. Like they had to find. They finally we've caught this guy. And I was like, I had lawyers in in talks with these people trying to like get to the bottom. Like, what is going on? What is happening? And they just decided to you know do it this way. I wasn't hiding from anybody, but yeah, they came and they flew um, four RCMP officers on their own plane. Flew it from mm-hmm. Saskatch from Saskatchewan to Halifax, where I spent six days in solitary confinement at the at the uh, Burnside Correctional Facility. Mm-hmm. And then flew me out to Saskatchewan in chains, my arms and you know ankles and wrists and belly chains, the whole like like I'm Pablo Escobar. Yeah, and I you know stopped four times for gas or whatever it was, and and then I did near you know two and a half months in in jail in in Saskatchewan before I could get bail. I have no criminal record. I've never been convicted mm-hmm. of anything. And and there was a murder while I was there. Shortly after I got there, a week after I got there, a woman stabbed another girl in the neck at a dance club, killed her. She was out on bail the next day. But I, you know, I'm too dangerous to be left let, let out. And yeah. and if it wasn't for my my lawyers and my legal team, I probably would still be in there. It was uh, they were really motivated to make sure I did not get out. And this is this is an assault charge. So I've I've spoken to common police, several police. common yeah. assault charge. Yeah, yeah. not I've even like a violent to... aggravated with a weapon. No, it just they charged uh, Randy Hillier with the same for for doing this poke. Yeah. So uh, it's funny because I've spoken to several police officers about how warrants are, are executed. Uh, and many of them have said to me, they've never seen Canada wide warrants yeah. other than political prisoners, which would be you and Tamara Leach. Yeah. Uh, Tamara was also given a Canada wide arrest warrant. Same thing. They flew yeah. across the country, picked her up because she was in a photograph with me, even though we were surrounded <laughs> We were surrounded by our entire, the vast majority of our legal team was in the yep. room with us, which is yep. part of the condition. Yep. Um, but I've heard of two Canada wide warrants in my life. And I mean, I know they happen for extreme cases. You know, there's a murder on the loose. The whole country is looking for that, the guy. That guy in Saskatchewan, I don't even think had a Canada wide warrant who had 59 violent convictions and was wanted and, and uh, murdered, stabbed all those people. I don't even think that guy had a Canada wide warrant. Like there's tons yeah. of violent criminals walking around, hundreds, thousands, maybe walking around that no one's really looking for. But we're going to spend this much money and time and resources to go get a grandmother because she took a picture with a guy. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It is embarrassing. And, you know, when I'm listening to you tell the story about six days in solitary confinement, two and a half months right. in jail. I think I did 15 uh, days total in solitary confinement, but it's, yeah, which is so, not a lot to, in jail terms, you know, like it's mm-hmm. a whole, yeah. like the army. Now I'm a jail uh, experience guy too. And in jail, it's like yeah. 15 days is the big deal. I know guys that did like eight months, a year in solitary, like mm-hmm. insane, yeah. you know, but yeah, it is. I mean, th- this is, this is a psychological yeah. torture. I mean, it's Try, and, solitary confinement is torture. Yeah, if people think it's not a fun. I didn't even have a toilet. I didn't. Have, you had to bang on the door if they wanted to take let, to go to the washroom, and they they let you out when they felt like it, which was whenever, you know. And you yeah. had you know ninety seconds to go run and you know take a leak and get back in the get back in the cage. And that was it. And you you know there's no TV. There's not. You just sit there all day, yeah. days, and just yeah. look at the walls. And it's like, yeah, yeah. So so the one thing when I listen to you, you know, say that you you spent that time in solitary two and a half months in jail. I can't help thinking that thank you for your service. <laughs> I, honestly, honestly like that's, that's what comes to mind. That's what comes it, to mind. It's funny that you say that because 
you know, we were saying earlier when people say thank you for I'm like I don't really feel proud I mean I'm proud of the job we did in regards to being professional soldiers I'm proud of the guys for you know mm-hmm. um, the things we had to face and deal with together and I mean politics aside it was war and we were doing our job and mm-hmm. and that's that's it's a, that's a separate thing from everything else so I'm I'm proud of that and like I wish we should never have been there obviously but mm-hmm. I didn't, you know, it's not not to up to decide, you know, it's it's up to us to do and die or whatever the you know the, yeah. the poem does, right? Um, but when people say, like, I actually would feel more, like, I feel more uh, of a, like, I believe in what I'm doing now far more than I ever did in the military. So me too, me too, yeah, uh, absolutely. Like for you, for me, and for a lot of the other people, uh, I wish more veterans uh, would become more public about their their belief system. Um, I have, I have a, I won't say his name because it, I want to be fair to him, but I have one of my several former commanding officers. Dox him. I speak. Yeah, I should dox him. I speak to him (laughs) regularly. regularly. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And, and you know, the best, the best thing about him, he was the best commanding officer I ever had in my entire career. This was the, the top of the top. Uh, yeah. he reached out to me during, he was already retired, but, uh, okay. recently retired, but he reached out to me during the convoy. And to this day, not one single person I ever served with ever to this day, ever reached out to me other than this one commanding officer that I had not one. And I'm talking all of my, my close friends that I went through training with, that I served with nothing. I am like persona non grata, uh, you know, yeah. in, in the military, I don't care. I really don't care. Uh, but well, I mean, that's that's what you would expect from the officer world, right? Like, I guess nobody I nobody ever accuses the military of being loyal. Nobody <laughs> ever does, ever, um, or even remotely fair, uh, unless you're you, you know, unless you're trying to get promoted and you're on the United Way committee. Yeah. Hey, you know, nobody's ever going to be loyal. But yeah, so. I, I could bitch about the military all day long, but I'm not going to do that. I, I mean, this is all about you, um, but. I want to ask you a a question during the time of the arrest, when they issued the Canada wide warrant, did anything happen that same week that you might've been involved with? Uh, Did you attend any rallies? Did you attend any political events? Did you do anything that particular week that a couple of days later resulted in a Canada wide warrant being issued for your arrest? Not that I, well, the only, the only minor. This thing is a that, trap. This is a trap. Is it? Okay. okay. I don't. Yes. I don't. Go ahead. You, my, my memory's not because uh, I don't. Um, I'm not much of a schemer. I just kind of, you know, like the, I just do okay. things. You know, yeah. I don't really write it Stop. down, and I got to remember. I just do and go, and I forget about it. And I don't. I don't my do advice to you, though, for your memory, if you want to improve it, is stop resting your head bes- be- beside uh, trees that attract RPGs. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Did you happen Magnetic. to attend? Did you happen to attend and maybe punk a uh, oh, that, political candidate? Yeah. Political yeah. candidate who yeah. was speaking at a rally well, within a couple of days of your your warrant being arre- uh, issued. Well, I remember I I found out when the actual warrant was put out, and it was a couple of weeks prior to it being executed. It wasn't like okay. that day. It was, it was previous to that, so I don't mm-hmm. think it was related. I have made a point okay. though to say okay. that you know, I, especially internationally, I've had Americans and Australians and other you know people I talk to in these circles come out and say, "I can't believe what this liberal government is doing to you guys." And I said, "Actually, I've never come across any evidence to suggest that the liberals went out of their way to go get this guy." However. Mm-hmm. There is evidence yeah. that another political party has done exactly that. And mm-hmm. I've, you know, had my bank accounts canceled and now my, you know, insurance benefits are cut off and I've had police come and interrogate me in prison and, you know, this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, and that's not coming from the liberals, but it came from somewhere. And, yeah. um, but, but I, at, I, you know, right before that at Morgan, uh, you know, my partner had, she'd been arrested, she spent four days in solitary again. Uh, on a on a, a gas theft gas charge stage, for yeah, sixty dollars, yeah. sixty dollars that she allegedly forgot to pay, so they put in a, a warrant for her and had her. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. this is just I how we. That. This is how um, it's like. If I sneeze near a library, I may I mean, a SWAT team may descend upon me for like violently, you know, violent expulsion of bodily fluids in a public place or something. You know, I yeah. don't know what it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's gotten crazy. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. I don't think it was directly related. But uh, this has okay. been brewing for a while. They they don't like me, and I've I've been, 
I think as of April 2020, around that time, it's also come come to light that I've been I was put on a persons of interest list of, of a POI list of the RCMP in Saskatchewan, mm-hmm. which I can't understand why, except for in April of 2020, I I put out a video that had a few million views about the Gabriel Wartman massacre in Nova Scotia and, and mm-hmm. criticizing the RCMP and their response and why they did this wrong, they did that wrong, they did and people. Well, how would you know? I was like, well, a lot of this was similar to my job I did for a long time. This is basic standard procedure. So why didn't they do it? Why you know this and that? And you know, a lot of people agreed overwhelmingly that yeah, this is this doesn't make sense. And then shortly after that, I'm a person of interest to the police. So again, what crime did I commit? Was I no criminal record? Never been charged? Never been arrested? Nothing ever in my life? I had a speeding ticket when I was 19. You now that's it. And so the, I'm I'm deserving and warranted of, of of attention from the police. And the Saskatoon police were watching me and every, like just because I said things that that they didn't like. We're going to leave Jeremy's story here for now and pick it up again next week. He's got a lot more to say about our military and political leaders, his adventures in debanking, and the male instinct, how his podcast, Raging Dissident, has brought validation to the masses who believe they were alone in their belief that the government is totally off base, how honored he feels to hear from those who feel no one is listening and no one cares and how witnessing this wreckage affirms his resolve that those in charge are not good people, and his firm commitment to change. That's all coming in part two of my interview with Jeremy McKenzie on next week's Meet Me in the Middle podcast.